So to our distinguished panelists, Board of Advisor, our moderator, and of course, you are dear audience, welcome to today's webinar entitled Recalibrating Our Priorities During and After COVID-19 Bootstrapping Philippine Tourism. And I am Ayla Gutierrez of the AIM Dr. Andre Elkan Center for Tourism, and I will be your virtual, virtual MC for today's event. So today's webinar is organized by the Asian Institute of Management, Dr. Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism, and the AIM School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning. Now, to formally open today's webinar, may I call on Secretary Jesse A. Lapos, Chairman and Founder of the AIM, Dr. Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism, for the opening remarks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, pleasant afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Recalibrating Our Priorities During and After COVID-19, Bootstrapping Philippine Tourism. We are honored and with the participation of our distinguished panel of experts, namely Dr. Maria Cherry Lynn Rodolfo, Professor Milet Zamora, Mrs. Ms. Eileen Clemente, and Attorney Leslie Jean Cordero. Judging from the record number of registered participants of almost 1,200 coming from 12 countries, it is clear that this is indeed an opportune time to address our shared concern and anxiety on Philippine tourism. After all, as soon as the countries and the territories impose their travel restrictions and social distancing, the alarm rang loudly with such worldwide headlines such as, and I quote, travel and tourism bleed on the stage of collapse. Tourism, global tourism, braces for the worst year on record. Will it survive? Against this backdrop of unfamiliar challenges, we look forward to our today's discussion on how Philippine stakeholders can collaborate and participate in restarting tourism activities in the country. We also hope to start a conversation and try to answer the question, how can all players, including tourists, be part of the recovery process? We at the center remain positive that as in any other crisis, opportunities lurk in tourism's emerging new normal. And in today's webinar, we echo the United Nations World Tourism Organization as we give emphasis to the value of cooperation and networking. Well, okay, let's get on with the webinar. I wish everyone an insightful and fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Lapos. May I now call on Dr. J.P. Rivera to briefly introduce the AAM School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. This webinar is organized by the Dr. Andrew Elton Center Tourism and the AIM School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning. And as many of you know, the Center of, for Tourism of AIM's broader goal is to assist and, up, and uplift tourism industries through research, educational programs, and conferences, just like what we are doing today, with the goal of achieving sustainable tourism not only in the Philippines but in the ASEAN region. Meanwhile, the School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning, or SEAL, is the executive development arm of the Asian Institute of Management and with it, we provide leading-edge differentiated and results-oriented executive education programs and these programs build the managerial and leadership capabilities and enable participants to become lifelong learners in their organizations and communities. Ayla? Thank you, Dr. Rivera. So just to guide everyone on the flow of the program, um, the webinar will proceed first uh, with the panel discussion with our experts, and this will be followed by uh, a caucus or a reaction among selected tourism stakeholders. And finally, of course, we want to hear from you through our question and answer portion. So please make sure to post your questions at the Q&A panel of Zoom um, so we can, so we along with the panelists can view them. So now without further ado, 
May I call on Professor Fernando Martin Y. Rojas, Executive Director of the AIM Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism and Faculty of the Asian Institute of Management to introduce our panelists and facilitate the discussion. Prof. Nani. Hi, good morning to everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have a very accomplished and powerful cast of uh, knowledgeable experts. They all happen to be women, by the way. And we'll start off with. Uh, one who is part of the Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism uh, Manage, uh, Advisory Board. Maria Sherilyn Rudolfo, or Twinkle, is on the advisory board of the AIM Dr. Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism and an adjunct professor at the Asian Institute of Management. She has more than 20 years of experience in tourism and aviation research, consulting for government, private sector, and international development partners. She has served as consultant and resource person on tourism development, destination management, tourism master planning, sustainable tourism, liberalization, competition policy, and many other related fields. She has successfully convened international conferences such as the Destination APEC 2020, enhancing tourism and air connectivity in the Asia Pacific region, trade and health services in APEC, where recommendations became translated into policy actions by concerned agencies. She served as either consultant or resource persons to organizations such as APEC, Philippine Study Center Network, PIDS, GIZ, USAID, AUSAID, APEC Secretariat, ASEAN Secretariat, World Tourism Organization, and the Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and East Asia, WHO, and the ATP. From 1997 to 2015, she taught economics at the University of Asia and the Pacific and served as program director of the Master of Science in Industrial Economics for three years. From 2013 to 2016, she served as co-chair of the Export Development Council Networking Committee on Transport and Logistics and president of REID Foundation. She obtained her Doctor of Philosophy in Economics from the Ateneo de Manila University an MS in Industrial Economics from the Center for Research and Research and Communication, and a BA Management Economics honorable mention from the Ateneo de Manila University. May I present Dr. Twinkle Rodolfo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, hey, um, allow me to share my screen. Okay, good afternoon. So thank you very much to um, AIM at Dr. Andrew Tan Tourism Center for Tourism Research for inviting me to join this uh, webinar. Um, I just would like to share uh, some thoughts about the, the topic. Um, first is that um, tourism is a critically impacted industry. And this uh, particular uh, description resonates in most of the bills actually that have been filed in our um, Congress in order to provide stimuli package to the industry. So before the COVID, the industry contributed about 12.7% to our Philippine GDP. And I think what is uh, really very important to highlight is the employment impact of the, of the industry. And that's about 5.4 million um, persons employed. About 49%, at least 49% are women. And um, the regional impacts of tourism are actually why very wide because almost all of our um, destinations in the regions participate in this um, business. In terms of uh, the impact of uh, different types of crises and to answer the question more or less like how long will it take for us to recover, the World Travel and Tourism Council um, actually conducted a study 
to analyze um, the recovery period of a number of um, crises that happened uh, worldwide from disease um, uh, to environmental disaster, political turmoil, and terrorism. And if you look at the average period of recovery for um, crisis related to uh, disease or health, um, it took about on the average 19.4 months for tourism destinations to recover. In some cases, it reached up to about 31, 32, 35 months. Now, a key factor in the um, rapid recovery of a number of destinations um, are elements that include engagement of the private sector, most special, and also the network resources that were shared, the market mix, rapid and effective policy response, and community engagement. So in the case of the Philippines, for example, um, in the case of uh, the SARS crisis that happened in 2003, we were able to recover actually quite fast in a period of about five to six months on the average. In fact, in some of our um, international source markets, we did not experience any decline in arrivals. And the SARS crisis actually provided opportunity for the industry to shift to a more aggressive promotion of the domestic tourism market. In 2003, we saw the rise of destinations such as Bohol, Palawan, um, Davao, and a lot more. And it also paved the way for government investments in infrastructure. So from that period onwards, we saw a number of our airports upgraded um, by the government using um, national resources and also external um, funding. Now, if we zero in on the health crisis that um, the global travel and tourism experienced, so the longest um, period of recovery was in the case of the UK foot, foot and mouth disease. And um, SARS, it took actually about 16 months for destinations such as China to recover. Now, the difference is that in the case of this COVID-19 pandemic, our borders were closed, both international and domestic. This did not happen in all of this health-related crisis that the world experienced in the past decades. And based on the latest report of the UNWTO, seven out of 217 destinations as of May have started to ease travel restrictions for international tourism purposes. Still, 100% of all destinations worldwide continue to have some form of COVID-19 related travel restrictions in place. So this is a different crisis that we are all facing. It's unprecedented. And in a way, this will actually reset our tourism industry. Second point I'd like to um, share is that recovery would be, will be calibrated, and it has been calibrated in the past months, something that we'd not, we didn't see uh, in all of the crises that we experienced in the past, even in the case of the global economic crisis, which actually had a deeper dent on the performance of the industry in the case of the Philippines. That was an economic crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, but however, we are actually seeing some signs of recovery in the domestic um, markets here in, as example, in Southeast Asia, in the case of Vietnam for Hanoi and also Thailand. Um, they are also relying on the domestic travel markets as entry points for recovery, just like the Philippines. In the case of our country, prior to the COVID, in 2019, the, this chart illustrates how connected our destinations were in terms of air travel. So this connectivity was not present about 10 to 15 years ago, but because of the investments made in tourism and also the allied industries, the domestic connectivity increased. And we've not yet included the connectivity related to inter-island sea travel and also land transport or land travel. Um, as of May 18, 2020, our domestic recovery or our domestic travel has not yet reached the point that our neighbors actually are experiencing. And that's because we have been very, uh, very careful, very calibrated in terms of um, opening up our borders, most especially our domestic borders. So now we are seeing local governments um, really exerting also their, their, um, their effort 
in order to prepare their uh, destinations. And as we have seen in the past um, weeks, the local governments decide when they are ready for domestic air connectivity to resume for commercial travel, even though um, these destinations are already under general community quarantine. Now, this chart on the right side are actually the the, the chart includes um, airports that are now ready to accommodate commercial flights. So this raises the question as to whether this will be our new travel corridors in the next three to six months because of the readiness of these destinations. And if you look at the different portfolio of products that we find in these destinations, yes, they have a lot to offer, but I just would like to make the point that we're not really uh, making a choice between um, health and economy. For me, my personal view is that it's still, it's always health. And we're opening up the, econ the economy, we're opening up the borders because we also would like to promote better health among our communities because there are also other aspects of health that we have to account for. In the coming days, there may be more borders to be opened, but the key challenge is whether we can transform these destinations into travel corridors under this um, new environment. So related to that, we also asked the question, why travel? So if these borders are open, why travel? For us, the first question we need to ask is what is the compelling reason for business it's clear that they need to, uh, business travelers need to um, explore, uh, they need to um, engage in activities in other destinations that let's say online meetings could not really um, support. So this is very crucial. What would really allow us to, or motivate us to travel to another destination given the conditions uh, in terms of protocols and the like. And then the cost because of some of the uh, protocols that we will need to shoulder or let's say if we need to shoulder, let's say quarantine. And then the confidence. What will assure us that travel is safe? Um, is travel safe, secure, and seamless? Are we assured enough? So uh, in one group, uh, the Safe Travel Alliance together with the Raja Travel Corporation Tourism Knowledge Center is currently conducting a survey related to the perceptions of um, individuals about transportation safety and initial or preliminary results reveal that among all modes of transport, they rated um, air travel as the mode that is actually safest at this point. And then of course, we need to, to also consider comfort. And this is where now the, the protocols come in. Uh, right now we have protocols um, available or are being implemented in the hotels, resorts, and the like. Now, we also have to ask the question as to whether our tourism sites, not just museums, but also those that we offered before for other um, activities are already are ready for the, the kind of travel that we'd like to promote. So it's very important to regularly engage the private sector for the development of safety and health protocols. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel because other um, available uh, standards and protocols that we can actually um, use as benchmark or reference. Now, this presents therefore an opportunity for better than the new normal. Um, today, we are actually affected by disaster, disruptions, and disequilibrium. But we aim that tomorrow we will achieve recovery. And, but at the same time, we have an opportunity for reset, for resetting our um, priorities. Uh, more than calibrating, it's resetting our priorities in order to gain resiliency. And this is where I'd like to mention that in recovery plans that are currently being um, drafted or that are currently being reviewed, I just would like to also include that may be a provision on how we can assist um, enterprises to also exit the industry if they decide to, or if they decide to pursue um, repurposing of their facilities. Um, we know that we'd like to recover as much as we can, but given the, the current situation and the longer period of recovery that may likely happen, depending on how soon, of course, the vaccine will be made available and how soon we can boost travel confidence and how soon their destinations will be ready. Those enterprises that are willing to actually exit the industry and pursue other opportunities in other sectors of the economy should be also included in these recovery programs. Now, 
at the center of this transition from our situation today to tomorrow is what we call the set of networks that will either allow us to accelerate to reaching recovery, re uh, reset, and resiliency, or networks that can actually slow us down. So strong, innovative, and responsive networks have been present during the period of the COVID pandemic. We have seen, we have witnessed airlines, um, shipping lines, accommodation, um, accommodation uh, sector um, uh, players repurpose their facilities in order to respond to the needs of the industry, to the call of the industry, to help tourists actually go back to their respective homes and also to allow our stranded um, um, tourists, stranded overseas Filipino workers to also um, come back and to go back to their respective homes. So all of these networks are present, but the key question is, uh, which of these strong networks can we strengthen further and then which of these weak networks or poor networks in our respective local destinations can we assist or can we help so that later on we can also tap them or harness their strength to allow us to become more resilient destination and eventually allow us to reach the sustainable development goals. Lastly, I'd like to focus on the role of cohesive and collaborative networks. Um, in one of the um, World Economic Forum uh, discussion, um, one of the speakers mentioned that the COVID pandemic is an attack on, uh, an attack on our social cohesion. At the same time, this gives us an opportunity to address th these weaknesses. And I'd like to mention three points. First is the call to action. And we have seen this in all the recovery assistance and recovery programs being crafted. Uh, but I'd like to highlight inclusive, inclusive recovery assistance to include not just the marginalized sectors, but also those who, as I mentioned earlier, are willing to enter into other sectors of the economy, but at the same time be integrated in the tourism industry indirectly. I refer, for example, to those who, um, who would like to pursue more, let's say, of um, the backward linkages in the case of um, agriculture, because um, food security is one of the key um, pillars of our resiliency and sustainability. The second is innovation. So we need to pursue contactless, frictionless um, mobility and um, interaction under this new environment. But innovation should be something that is adapted already across all the um, enterprises in the industry, not just the bigger players, but most especially the smaller um, players um, in the sector and in the destinations. And again, during the pandemic, we saw companies um, moving vegetables and uh, fruits and other food supplies and other medical supplies in order to, in order to meet the demands of other destinations that need them. And innovation became a key element uh, with the development of apps, uh, digital um, technology and the like. The third is infrastructure. Republic Act 9593, particularly Section 34, provides already the, the policy and legal framework for us to be able to pursue more convergence programs with national government in order to assist, most especially local destinations that do not have much resources. So apart from roads, these opportunities of convergence exist in the case of sanitation, health, water, solid waste management, infrastructure that actually lag behind the development of the, of the key infrastructure such as roads, airports, and seaports. Last is institutional strengthening. There are policy reforms that can be pursued, um, allowing, for example, um, additional investments to come in, whether they come, let's say, from foreign sources for those industries that are ready to accommodate them. And another point is to strengthen our local government units because the pandemic actually highlighted uh, local governments or destinations that actually require significant assistance in terms of um, resiliency and um, um, being able to respond to crisis. The second is community engagement. Right now, we have a number of our stakeholders, students, um, um, students, um, 
uh, families who have resources, not just in terms of money, but more importantly, in terms of time. So these are resources that we can tap in order to pursue conservation in our destinations. So recovery assistance maybe can support, let's say, um, displaced fisher folks so that they could um, be tapped to, to do mangrove rehabilitation, mangrove um, or uh, reforestation programs so that in the end after three after two to three years we will have greener destinations and this is the best opportunity for us now to leverage with national and international networks because the pandemic practically equalized almost all destinations so we have much to learn from other um, stakeholders and lastly communication plan we need to communicate really transparent information to our stakeholders and engage the, ex the existing strong and weak networks in the industry. Are, are the youth strong networks or are they the part of the weak networks? As part of recovery programs, we need to, uh, to reassess the role of each member of, the, of these networks so that eventually we could achieve the resiliency that we need for the Philippine tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodolfo. Winko, thank you very much for that very enlightening uh, presentation. Now, we'll, uh, without much uh, ado, we'll go to the next speaker. Uh, and this, she's someone who has been working very closely with us in many of our capacity building programs. This is Milet Zamora. Okay, Milet is the treasurer of uh, Nelza Development Corporation, where she uh, handles transactions with banks and monitors their corporate investments in the Philippines and abroad. She was formerly a uh, full-time assistant professor at the College of Business at De La Salle University, where she taught basic and major marketing subjects in the undergraduate and the graduate programs. Prior to joining the academe, she was a marketing manager at ABS-CBN International and at ABS Broadcasting Corporation, where she handled product imaging enhanced strategic product development for different regions. She continues to practice as a marketing consultant in different segments of the industry. She obtained her master's in business management from the Asian Institute of Management and a bachelor of arts major in philosophy, minor in psychology from De La Salle University. Uh, Millet, please start your presentation. Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon everyone. Uh, Dr. Rodolfo asked a lot of questions in her presentation, and I think it's nice if we could uh, make this particular part of the discussion uh, interactive. So in my presentation, there will be some poll questions that you can answer, and we appreciate you answering the question. And the first one we should ask is, do I travel light? So if you could um, answer the question, I think, uh, there you go. If you could uh, just answer and then submit, right? Do I even next? <clears throat> I decided to uh, I decided to name my presentation "Space Travel" because for now the new normal is institutionalization of space, especially with social distancing. Uh, more than, it's more than six feet. Three feet, one meter, it's still space. So uh, it's going to be space travel from now on. And for now, next question. Given that idea of uh, having to put space in between travelers, do you really think the world still deserves to be explored? Uh, it would be nice to know as honestly as you can because Dr. Rodolfo asked, why do we travel in the first place? Well, we'll try to answer that question here now. Okay. See, the present reality is this. There is no more relevant time than now for sustainable tourism to have a greater meaning. The industry has suffered its worst disaster yet. Before, when a when a destination will close down, we'll just go somewhere else. That's where the diversification of portfolios would come in. But as of right now, the shutdown covered the whole world. And there are no alternative destinations. Little by little, 
the old destinations will open and little by little we will have confidence to go back to them. What used to be a very interactive experience where you travel with family and friends, now it's isolated no? with the social distancing measures. So what happens now? There are implications and more new founded perceptions on this particular case. One, it's sustainable tourism used to be first do no harm. You go to a destination and you don't do anything to it. You enjoy everything. But now it's when I get to a destination, I'm going to make it a better place. Second, all destinations now, uh, a destination now reflects all destinations. Just like Dr. Rodolfo said, it equalized, this pandemic equalized everything. So whenever we go to this, uh, travel to a destination, we resolve to make this destination much stronger. Again, why do we travel? We'll ask that question in a while. Now, well, personally, I travel for, for fulfillment. And this space travel thing, uh, this social distancing, it's, it sounds so negative, but we can look at it this way. The space that is now between us is space for Mother Earth. It gives us time, it gives us the opportunity to save the destination. So, whole time, the world should be explored for. We'd like to hear your, your, um, your, your reasons for traveling. Next. When I was uh, researching the best practices for this particular um, part of the discussion for the reboot, uh, the best practices, for example, for the local national governments and the departments of tourism of each of the countries now have the responsibility to own the global health guidelines for travel and social distancing. This has to be in major collaboration with the private sector. See, the health guidelines or guidelines or even the rules, no? they have to be trickled down if not cascaded down to the to the local government, to the it's to the private sector, to the travel vendors, no? because they're the ones who will be implementing these and communicating these to the travelers. Of course, this will all come from the WHO and the UNWTO health protocols. The most important best practice that has to be made here or has to be executed here is the transparency of information. It has to be truthful, accurate, timely, and relevant. Sometimes we really don't know which one is fake news anymore. So um, if you notice, I'll put the next box. There is nothing yet on the marketing side. The marketing side will have to follow everybody else afterwards. The destination marketers will install the new normal at the destination. So what, we, what do we mean by all communications campaigns reflect the new normal? So all signs, all um, point of purchase standees, posters, brochures, this all will have to reflect the information that comes from the national governments and the WHO, whereas the private sector will just collate and try to seamlessly put them together to have a nice a well-made communication campaign at the destination. One of the, uh, one of the most common uh, best practices that uh, basis for destination marketers to give us a message is community spirit. They've found that travelers will gravitate to a destination whose values and ethics are espoused by the destination themselves. So they will look for destinations that are like them. So that's a good start wherein we can instill more confidence in the traveler. The tour operators now, the, one of the best practices after disaster was to diversify a portfolio. That meant to go out to other destinations, but that's no longer uh, an option. So what marketing is uh, recommending is to design an itinerary that reflects the new normal guidelines. So for example, if you want to go tandem uh, paragliding, right, we wear the mask and hopefully the guy behind you doesn't breathe in the back of your head. So the, the, 
the new itineraries that will reflect the new normal guidelines have to be uh, designed with the DMOs, the tour operators, and the travel vendors. The travel vendors, especially the transport industry, they have the opportunity now to streamline capacity management. The embassies now have new ways to communicate and implement visitor requirements. The hospitality vendors to assure that there's hygiene in um, the accommodation vendor, the accommodations um, provider. The partner operators this is very important. Now that the world will try to open their borders for each other, the partner operators have to really communicate with each other and say, look, not yet. Don't, let's not scare the people or let's not inordinately give false expectations to the travelers. We will, we will um, uh, go to your destination first and support your destination and then we'll support the others as well. And the travel vendors, the ones who um, produce bags, yeah, um, swimsuits, you can, this is an opportunity now to re redesign and bespoke pack hats. Pack hats now are so common when travelers share with each other what they do to make the travel experience better, safer, cleaner, actually. So, all time, given all of these things, Dr. Um, Rodolfo also put it in her statistics, there will be a cost. Are you now aware that traveling will cost more? Whatever your answer, I think there's only one obstacle to the traveling, to the travel cost. It's fear. On, on two sides. One, the travel vendors uh, fear that the tourist will not believe that the destination is safe, will not accept the new normal, will not be willing to pay the premium for the new normal, and will blame them for the increased inconvenience during travel. This is the, the challenge of seamlessness in uh, between the implementation of the new normal by the departments of tourism and the travel vendors and the tour operators. Communication is very, very important during this time. On the other hand, the traveler will feel that, <clears throat> uh, or they will not believe that the DMOs are telling the truth. They see that the local vendors are not implementing the new normal guidelines. And this is one thing that uh, I think about 80 to 90% of the researchers who have done research after a disaster for recovering in, a in the travel industry, discounts are seen as doubtful. Okay? They are false enticements to make the travelers return. The recommendation is to add value and not to, not to give discounts. And lastly, the traveler is afraid that increasing restrictions are restrictions on their enjoyment. So we, need, we have another poll question. After being aware that the traveling will cost more, are you willing to accept that idea that it will cost more? And guys, thanks for answering. I can see, your, I can see the results. It's really good. Thank you. So with all of these, what does marketing have as best practices for recovery after a disaster? One, when we shed light on the disaster, the language should elicit empathy. We plea for assistance, which develops a community. We inform of the recovery plans, which exactly what's happening with all the research that is being done and the reporting that is being done to both uh, governments and the private sector. And this one will generate interest again. The most common message that can be sent to the traveler is we are open for business. An anecdote of this is, uh, of, this is very important. When 9-11 happened in New York, David Letterman, he hosts a late night show, he was mourning for the, for the city. And at that time, Mayor Rudy Giuliani told him, no, do not mourn, open your theater, do your show, because what we want to tell the world is that we're open for business. And opening for business, uh, opening business, it consolidates the demand. And um, that's when 
people will realize, you know, we are exerting effort to open up uh, the destinations for their enjoyment as well. And once we are able to communicate success, all of the stakeholders will, uh, will see themselves owning the campaigns and the success of the campaigns. We have another poll question. Are you willing to set aside the resources to fulfill travel objectives? I hope so. We'll see each other traveling. That would be fun. Marketing now. Okay. We'll do this. Because we are able to shed light on the disaster, we elicit empathy, we develop concern among the community, we make each other responsible for whatever it is that we're going to do, we are genuine in our actions, and whatever it is that we do, we are invested in it. And to whom do we communicate this? We call them now the inspired traveler who feels responsible for the footprint that they leave once they leave a destination. Second, they feel protective of the destination that they visit. And they will be fair in spending tourist money on the destination. We are hoping that the result would be this, that the inspired traveler will be part of the recovery, not a means to. We want to engage everyone in this recovery and the rebooting of travel. The inspired traveler becomes the example of sustainable tourism. Um, there is a recommendation that once all of these travel corridors have been opened, the Filipino tourist or the Filipino traveler will be will execute the, uh, the correct protocols in travel. That is when we become the instruments and examples of how it is to travel properly. And lastly, the inspired traveler redefines and defends the industry in the new normal. We make this very, we make this uh, point very seriously because uh, once we are able to assure uh, the traveler that it is safe to, to go to the destinations, the traveler himself or herself changes. Uh, and we want the change not to be uh, based on what it is now, but since it's been rebooted and we're all equalized now, we have the opportunity to start from scratch and to look at each other, the destination, and the process of traveling in the, the newest possible way. And it will be much more enjoyable then. There is a question <clears throat> in the second, in the question and answer. I'd like to just give a little bit of my insight to this. The first question was, are we ready to face the new normal? You'd be surprised when the ECQ became an MECQ, everybody went to the mall. We are ready, but what is what we may not be ready for is the, um, the, the repercussions of carelessness in the travel. Pre-travel, we were told before the MECQ that we should, do, we should stay at home. When that happened, when it opened up a little bit, we were told to wear masks and be careful, and we didn't. So the, 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 the inspired traveler has to be, to be molded still. You know? um, and unfortunately, uh, some of my friends have asked me, is it, going to be, is it going to go back to the normal? No, it will not be normal anymore. It will be completely different. And each one of us has to be very ready to be able to contribute to the new definition of travel in the travel. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Milet. That was so insightful. Um, without much ado, we'll go to the third panelist. And uh, third panelist is Ms. Eileen Clemente, who is the chairman and president of Raja Travel Corporation, which has evolved from just a plain travel agency to a travel corporation over the years. The Tourism Knowledge Center, a new initiative of Raja Travel, produces travel talk series research initiatives, and microsite development of various tourist destinations in the country. Raja has also established the Tourism Site Management, which offers a range of consultancy, management, 
and development services for both established and emerging hotel resort properties, tourism sites, and other establishments. Raj's meeting and events department specializes in incentive trips, team building, group travel meetings, and conferences abroad. Ms. Clemente has received several awards like the Global Peace Prize Award for Empowered Women in Tourism, organized by the International Institute for Peace through Tourism India in partnership with the UNWTO in 2016. Eileen served in international and national associations such as the ASEAN Tourism Association, the Philippine Travel Agencies Association, the Philippine IATA Agents Travel Association, and the IATA Agency Program Joint Council. She's also a regular resource speaker in various tourism seminars and forums. Eileen is a double degree holder of a Bachelor of Science in Business Management and Economics from the St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. Being a second generation of one of the tourism pioneers in the country, she is fully equipped by experience with the necessary knowledge in travel and tourism. May we present Ms. Eileen Clemente. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm glad that I came after Twinkle and Millet because they covered a lot already. But um, for us to start with, although I have a lot to say, um, I just want to emphasize first on the three lessons that I feel are the most important. Um, the first learning is that it takes a while for people to get from philosophical discussion to general frameworking to actual implementation. And what we have seen from the World Travel and Tourism Council, as Twinkle has mentioned, is that um, there is a way for us to to not dwell too much on time, but to actually go further. And if we can look at the World Travel and Tourism Council, they already said some of their learnings. Do not try to reinvent or create new travel processes. Avoid creative solutions in silos and local standards. And in fact, it is rather that we have more collaboration and uh, we can build from seamless um, travel experience rather than looking at it from the point of view of just implementing something. Um, also embrace the global standards and protocols to make sure that whatever you're implementing locally is already acceptable globally and widely. And of course, we learn from the people in the outbreak response. So if the past were not recorded at all, this is the time to record everything that has been done to act as our baseline for the future. Um, also, we have to uh, embrace new technologies to allow contact tracing and testing in coordination with um, the other standards. We haven't seen a lot of the recovery plans right now with clear timelines. So I'm answering one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, I haven't seen any that had clear timelines, nor did they have clear indicators of how to move the timeline from one time to the next or one phase to the next. So if there's a way to, to do that, I think now is the time and including definitely having the right indicator so that it's not a moving timeline all the time. Um, when I say about global protocols, they have already been created for several industries and I've been part of this with the World Travel and Tourism Council. So they have already created the uh, hospitality, aviation, airports, tour operators and, and even MICE. So if you want to look at those and what can be acceptable under each of your LGUs and what you can push to your LGUs, please look at these and these are all download, downloadable because what what the World Travel and Tourism Council has done is to make it very accessible to everyone so that we can collaborate and grow together. The next lesson is that those who had a lot of excuses not to implement what needed to be implemented before now have no choice but to implement them. Carrying capacity for one. Um, although uh, COVID doesn't directly look at that, but having the right carrying capacity addresses the food security as well. It, it addresses water utility requirements of each area. So if it, now is really the time to create your new plan. And it's not just a tourism master plan, but a general plan for each of your um, LGUs. And most importantly is that there's a collaboration between the private sector and the government. And also um, another um, 
another factor that hasn't really been um, why I say about the excuses is that e-commerce allows a lot of or e-commerce and automation, automation of processes allows a lot of efficiency. So if you're asking me, where can the budget go? The budget can actually go to this because actually it saves at a later time, a lot of those costs that are not productive anyway, passing of papers, but these have had a lot of excuses because there have been turf wars. I need to own this information. I need to own this information. I shouldn't share it. And if they want to get their own information, somebody, they should get it again. So that's the next one. And the, the third is greed has been tempered. So what do I say with this? Um, what I mean is that um, it's not now just about economics. Everyone can now talk about resiliency. Um, it can now talk about the other um, aspects that creates a long-term solution for each destination. So um, the path to recovery as uh, identified by the World Travel and Tourism Council, I'm more concerned about stage three to stage four because this is where everyone gets stuck. Again, because of not having no timeline, there is really a, a big issue on how to go back to what is or to go to a new normal if we don't have a clear timeline and clear faces and clear indicators of how to get there. So what will the new normal look like? Of course, there will be new requirements, expectations, and there will be new implementation of policies. And of course, the crisis plans have to be in place even if this is just one of the crises. Of course, technology will be needed and also honest communication, which has been mentioned by the both previous speakers. And then what are the efforts that are being um, done by the World Travel and Tourism Council, which can be used by everyone as well. Um, the new travel experience, again, as I mentioned, if we are moving forward and making our plans, we have to make sure that we always put the traveler experience first in our minds and not just putting a lot of different steps for them to undergo because if you do that they will not travel more and then mapping the signposts to risk recovery as i mentioned we should have the right dashboards qualitative and quantitative to know how we are recovering and again toolkits there are best practices across different governments and different associations and different sectors within the tourism so why not put it all together and that is what world travel and tourism has done already and then compile all the lessons, the recovery, uh, all the success stories and best practices. And then again, share experiences. So moving forward, what are our compelling questions to move forward? Is this a realization for an overdue reinvention? Well, for me, definitely, because um, although Millet only mentioned more about the leisure tourists, there's a lot of different sectors also that require a lot of reinvention. For example, um, for meetings and events alone, there can be more hybrid conferences because why do I say hybrid and not move to pure virtual? I say that because face-to-face -face meetings of five hours is equal, uh, sorry, uh, the video conferencing calls that takes five hours is actually equivalent to only one hour face-to-face -face meeting. So maybe, um, that can be a good um, data in your mind when you create your future meetings as well. Um, of course, there are also aug augmented reality apps and we should be able to capitalize also and monetize the use of those for, for doing a good museum tour and similar. Um, also, um, registration management. When you do registrations right now for most seminars or uh, for all of these face-to-face. -face. There's a lot of paper going on. And again, as I said, resistance is just one of them uh, that hampers us doing electronic, which could have been done earlier on, even before COVID. So now it's really uh, overdue for reinvention to limit contact. There are other things that are related to that. So we will see repositioning of product offerings, as already mentioned, elevated level of service, um, there will be different policy formation and a different definition of world class 
destination. And of course, there will be lower consideration for massification of tourism and also higher consciousness on over-tourism. So another compelling question is, is travel now inconsequential as people have realized that the alternative can be done? As I mentioned, um, it cannot be replaced, but the, you can add on to your new markets. And what tourism activities also cannot be replaced, those that require the five senses or requires experience, excitement, and, and so I write here, food, you cannot virtually you know, um, tour food because you have to taste it or go surfing online. Although there are 3D surfings, but the feel of the water, the feel of, you know, of the sun and all of that and having um, uh, your selfies in the right place. Uh, even if you can do that virtually, you'd rather do it personally. So those are some of the things that are going to be around. But again, it will be reinvented or there will be a new way of doing things. And then what are the other questions? Will there still be employment opportunities in the industry? Yes. But again, as I said, things will change. So you may be required to have more skills, um, especially the e-skills that you need to have. Um, will travel influencers still have any influence left? That I really don't know. Um, that can be left at a later time. Will investment still be significant for tourism? Yes, but again, investments will probably change in how they are done. And will there, how much mergers and acquisitions will we see? There will be a lot, definitely. And how much will the whole process of travel become frictionless and contactless? So this should be the goal of every LGU, of every organization, of how we can make it seamless for the traveler. And then will rates go up or down? It depends again on what policies will be up there and what our travel insurance willing to cover. Um, but I would like to end with this. Um, as before, there have been several disruptions. Trains didn't bring an end to transportation. They grew it. Even though stagecoaches left um, and planes didn't bring an end to shipping and cruising, they grew it also. Resorts didn't bring an end to hotels, they grew it. Technology didn't bring an end to travel distribution, they grew it. So again, we have to be remain positive that things will go well. And um, I would just like to end with the note that it's just a change, it's not a death. Um, it may be a, a death of an old model, yes, but it will not be the end of tourism as we speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Such expertise and insight will do us all very well. Uh, for the last panelist, I'd like to call on attorney Leslie Cordero, who is now or currently a senior, uh, senior disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank. She is the DRM focal person in the Philippines, co-managing the disaster risk management, risk financing, and insurance programs in the country. She's been involved in other DRM projects in Vietnam, Myanmar, and the Fiji Islands. She's also co-leading the World Bank Group's Malawi Post-Conflict Rehabilitation and Recovery Technical Assistance for the Government. Ms. Cordero also served as Undersecretary of the Office of the President, Office of the Presidential Assistance for the Rehabilitation and Recovery, mandated to integrate the reconstruction efforts of government for Typhoon Yolanda. She also put together the Typhoon Pablo Rehabilitation and Recovery Plan for Mindanao. She also coordinated post-conflict projects through the Shahatra Bangsamoro Initiative, a program that provides basic health, education, and livelihood services in the conflict areas in Mindanao. In 2011, Leslie also served as Undersecretary at the Presidential Communications and Operations Office, tasked to prepare strategic communication plans and policies for the Office of the President. Leslie was one of the youngest appointed undersecretaries of the Aquino administration. She also served as commissioner of the National Youth Commission in 2010. Leslie graduated magna cum laude with a degree of Bachelor of Philosophy at the University of San Carlos in 2001 and a Juris Doctor of Laws at the Ateneo de Manila University of School of Law in 2005. Uh, presenting Leslie Cordero. Thank you very much, Prof. Nani, and good afternoon, everyone. Always a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. 
when we started discussing about uh, this webinar, they asked me to focus on lessons learned from past and recent disasters and how can we help the Philippine tourism industry uh, recover. My first slide would show you what are some of the key lessons learned from past and recent disasters and crisis. It's like deja vu for me because I remembered back in 2013 when we were doing Typhoon Yolanda recovery efforts in government, I was seated beside Governor Edgar Chato of Bohol because a month before Yolanda hit, the governor was uh, in Bohol was struck with a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. And he was literally bringing his recovery program to national government and saying, Les, can you please embrace Bohol and be the lead in helping Bohol recover post-earthquake? And his most uh, basic question was, we just need a little assistance from national government in making sure that our water and some of the common utilities in the Panglao area and other tourist destinations will be repaired or will be reconnected because they knew that the value of the tourism sector is double or triple the revenue that Bohol is getting. Similarly, Governor Sol Matugas of Surigao del Norte is saying, help us in looking at how we can recover faster after an earthquake that hit Shargao. And conversely, I think back in 2016, I remembered uh, I was already in World Bank and I was part of the team that was deployed to Fiji after they were hit by a Category 5 tropical cyclone, Winston, and the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Finance leading the recovery program was saying, Leslie, is there an opportunity in preparing the recovery program where you can focus some of the interventions to address some of the tourism sector needs because they knew that 68% of their revenue is coming from tourism. So what are some of these key lessons that we have learned uh, in a disaster? Of course, there is an enumeration. Uh, preparedness is key, the value of leadership, collaborative governance, better coordination with uh, stakeholders, but what they failed to tell us is that better coordination or this whole of society or whole of government approach will only work if there is someone leading, right? So that the private sector, the academe, the civil society organizations, and the industry practitioners can plug into. Previous uh, presenters and speakers already mentioned the value of strategic communication, but what is also crucial is transparency and accountability as well as the consistency and credibility of both the message and the messenger. And they've talked about the value of information, that information is gold. What are the available data sets that are there? And how can we ask every local government to prepare baseline data as part of an input to the recovery uh, program? And then striving for resiliency, the building back better concept. But we all know that after a crisis or a disaster, we have a lot of needs, but the resources are limited. So what do government usually do? The next slide would show you that the Philippine government has a plan. And back in March 2019, last year, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council has already approved uh, Philippine Disaster Recovery and Rehabilitation Framework. Learning from the lessons of how many disasters that the country has experienced, finally, NEDA has put in place uh, some of these templates and framework that moving forward, national government, local government, as well as the other stakeholders uh, can, can follow. So fast forward, I think four weeks into this whole COVID outbreak, I got a call from the Department of Tourism saying, as part of our uh, preparation of the Sustainable, Inclusive, and Resilient Tourism Program that World Bank is helping DOT with, can you help us think through 
how we can prepare a tourism response and recovery program. So what we did was help uh, Department of Tourism prepare a flexible as well as a sector specific uh, response and recovery program that is mirrored to what national government has for their disaster uh, recovery program. So you can see uh, in draft form some of these uh, sectoral outcomes as well as strategies that the Department of Tourism is looking at. I know it's very small, but it focuses and mirrors what national government in its national economic recovery program is doing. Why is this important? Because we all know that when the nuts and bolts have to be fixed, it would be easier for the Department of Tourism to submit to national government and get the appropriate financing that is needed to support the industry. So crucial to highlight social services as well as assistance to livelihood as well as appropriate infrastructure and then marketing and development and all the other institutional support that is needed. The next slide would show you that while we were helping the government in preparing a tourism response and recovery program, I think the DOT will be reaching out to the stakeholders, Tourism Congress of the Philippines, to the other operators uh, involved in the industry as well as local government to be able to consult as well as get your feedback and how they can improve and strengthen the response and recovery program. But for almost a year now, uh, the World Bank is helping uh, DOT together with five key destinations uh, pre-COVID. We're looking at Bohol, Siargao, Sikihor, Davao City, as well as Samal. And we were talking about how can you help these destinations? How can you support these destinations with both a budget as well as uh, an institutional uh, support to be able to have a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient uh, tourism program? And the DOT has a flagship program in this. And we were thinking, as government would respond to COVID, the level of flexibility is also important that we all know that the concept of sustainable tourism as we know it will not be the same. So how flexible are we in rethinking some of the components of these uh, proposed projects uh, that the World Bank is helping uh, that is uh, being prepared underway? Government is looking at, in their response phase, unemployment assistance, loan assistance for micro, small, and medium enterprise, of course, the social amelioration program, other financing, as well as those sweeper flights and then the repurposing of hotel establishments. But what is key is that this is an opportunity to think. While government is figuring out at the national level some of the broad strokes, as industry, uh, as, a, as practitioners, or some of the people who are participating here are consultants, how can you fit in? into this overall tourism response and recovery program of government? How can you avail of some of these assistance? Or what can you contribute from your respective organizations? The next slide would show you that this is an opportunity not just to respond, but also to reboot. While some of these destinations are still closed, while government is trying to figure out how you can reopen this travel corridor, it is crucial to look at upgrading of local infrastructure. Things that uh, we were complaining about, about environmental issues, issues on sustainability and carrying capacity, these destinations and the natural resources have an opportunity for the past two months to breathe, right, and to regenerate and recover. So I think uh, it is important for local government units also and national government to think, how can we start implementing? How can we transform and translate the different suggestions, recommendations, and plans into actual uh, things that they can implement at the local level before the whole destination reopens, before the country reopens? Of course, we also mentioned about revisiting some of these policies. 
and crucial is to invest in disaster preparedness and focus also on how we deal with health emergencies. Typhoons, earthquakes, I think the country is so used to it. There is an innate, uh, I think, instinct to be able to respond quicker as well as recover faster. But for some reason, coming uh, in terms of public health emergency, it, it's something different, it's something new. This next slide would show you that as government is trying to help in terms of rebooting, it is also an opportunity to start recovering. Everyone has been mentioning about intensive training and upskilling of manpower. How do you professionalize certain dimensions uh, of the sector and the allied services? Or is there an opportunity to be able to shift into industries or repurpose some of your tourism industry uh, businesses and enterprises into something that is needed in the recovery phase. Access to financing for micro small enterprises, incentivizing business expansion as they reopen, waivers of permits and license fees, and of course uh, everyone is talking about this Philippine Economic Stimulus Act. I think the Department of Tourism has contributed and presented uh, some of their interventions so that they can get uh, a budget uh, to, to support them and to support the various sectors in the industry. But the most important question now is that as government is doing this and preparing, again, crucial on our end as practitioners, as ordinary citizens, consulting firms, or local government to prepare our data. So that when government says, okay, we are ready to download the assistance, assistance will come in a first come first serve basis, knowing that there is a limited budget and crucial also to have data to back up whatever requests or interventions that you are applying for. So make this uh, or use this time as an opportunity to prepare those documents, those data, so that uh, when it reopens, you can submit quickly. After we talk about recovering, what is crucial is that we reimagine what are the new normal protocols and guidelines. How do you redefine a tourist experience and destination management uh, that was mentioned by Milet? And of course, invest in innovative and creative ways for product development. Promote sustainability, inclusivity, and resiliency. And everyone was talking about recalibrating and revisiting travel timelines, concepts, spaces, and experiences. And what is important to highlight is that we need to shift already and share the burden to collaborate and not just ask our government officials, both at the national and local level, to deliver and help us. It is important for stakeholders, communities, and tourists to also contribute. But the key here is, as we try to reimagine, it is also the ability of the people to be able to adjust, adapt, and evolve as fast as we can. Assess what are the future market demands so that you can fill that gap. And then, of course, as we start reopening, it is important to highlight that we have to restore confidence in the destination, and ensure that the level of safety, comfort, and security that a tourist or a traveler would have as they start deciding to take that next plane and go to the destination. This is always an opportunity to be able to reimagine how it feels like to sit or lie down in the beaches of Bohol, to sit down waiting for the sunset in Palawan, and of course, hoping that I would be going and surfing again in Chargao. So on that note, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Leslie. And maybe enjoy all the attendees to give the panelists a round of applause in their own way. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to turn you over now to Ayla Gutierrez. Thank you once again, Professor Rojas, Dr. Rodolfo, Ms. Mora. Ms. Demora, Ms. Clemente, and Attorney Cordero for sharing insights.
us, and we will have them again later during the Q&A. So for now, um, I would like to call on Dr. John Paulo Rivera, the Associate Director of the AIM Dr. Andrew Elton Center for Tourism, to introduce the selected tourism stakeholders who will share their reactions and insights regarding the discussion a while ago. Dr. Rivera. So I think we, we should now proceed with the active participants. So in the spirit of starting a conversation, apart from our roster of distinguished panel, we have also selected discussions from specific industry to give their inputs on how we can bootstrap Philippine tourism. Our first active participant is the general manager of Guide to the Philippines, Mr. Rabi Ang. Mr. Ang? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the uh, distinguished panelists for their very insightful presentations. Uh, I was busy taking down notes. Uh, I did learn a lot from uh, from all of you. Uh, as as a reaction, maybe just to echo some of the common points or the common threads that I heard in, in the in the presentations. Uh, well, I heard a lot about collaboration, uh, and then I also heard a lot. Secondly, on the changing how we do tourism, uh, and lastly, uh, a focus on innovation. So. Uh, just to provide some insights on that, uh, the first point about collaboration, uh, I think it's important to understand uh, in this, uh, the, the whole tourism value chain in this perspective and the different stakeholders and the roles that are, that are involved because any plan for reviving the tourism industry must involve all of these components. Um, nobody must be left behind, you know, not the tour guides, not the, not the local transport providers, not the, the local tour operators, the communities. And, and I think uh, most of all, not, not the environment. And I think it was touched on by, uh, by all of our uh, panelists about, the, uh, about sustainability. Because I, I think in the context of the value chain, the biggest value in terms of tourism is really derived from Mother Nature, you know, and, and, what, do they, and what does she get, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, in, all, of the, in all of the value that we were taking uh, from tourism. So, so I think that's, that's an important point to uh, to consider when we talk about collaboration, not to leave anyone uh, behind and make sure that everyone has a part uh, because people have lost their jobs, you know, uh, they're having a hard time, uh, uh, you know, providing for their family. So, so all of these have to be considered in the short and the long-term solution. Um, it was also mentioned about uh, collaborative governance was also mentioned. I think it's an important point to discuss because as we reboot the, the tourism sector, uh, it's important that everyone is on the same page. Uh, like right now, uh, leisure travel is uh, is banned, and then rightly so because uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but as one of the comments uh, also noted, there has to be a clear indicator on when the government can reopen leisure travel, and uh, it has to be clear on on what the standard protocols are to be implemented across the different sectors. Um, you know, uh, of course, it should support tourism while safeguarding the health. Uh, of local communities, like if uh, if we would uh, maintain, let's say, a 14-day quarantine uh, for every traveler, then of course that will not be conducive to tourism. So those kinds of indicators is it uh, is it when the, a certain number of cases are, you know, uh, is it certain rate of uh, uh, increase or decrease in the number of cases that we're seeing? So those kinds of things have to be uh, quantified and uh, clearly communicated to all stakeholders. Uh, Next, uh, sustainability was mentioned, changing how we do tourism. So I think this is, uh, this is very important that we redefine our value proposition. Uh, like on sustainability, once we do the reboot, is, uh, can the Philippines become like a poster child for, for sustainability? You know, how do we develop new products that would, uh, uh, that would highlight, you know, uh, not just the beauty of the place, but also of how to be part of... Uh, part of making it a better uh, place, as, uh, as Prof. Uh, Millet mentioned in her presentation. Um, 
part of also looking at uh, changing our value proposition. Maybe uh, we have to consider the Philippines as a multi-destination uh, experience. So reimagining itineraries was mentioned earlier, and I think this is important, you know, uh, in, in in managing over tourism and you know, uh, in in certain uh, popular destinations. How do we move tourists, uh, in not just to Boracay, Palau, but also to other destinations? I think on the uh, and in, in terms of inclusivity also, uh, facility improvements has also been mentioned about, you know, how to improve uh, hygiene, sanitation, sustainability, the healthcare uh, in, in many of the places that, uh, in many of the tourist destinations. And, uh, and we also need to reimagine, like, the different, uh, the different people affected, uh, the tourism workers, is there a way for them to be repurposed, you know, the skills that they have to, uh, to be part of, you know, uh, this facility improvement because as all of these are necessary in improving and preparing the destinations for the future uh, influx of travelers. And uh, finally, I'd also like to react on innovation. Uh, I think two points. Uh, first, innovation will make things a lot more efficient, uh, not just in selling, also in communicating uh, to travelers, uh, reaching out to a broader market. And then second, it's also, innovation is not just uh, technology, but it's also uh, innovation in terms of product development, and um, in 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 the use of technology, I, I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, is very important is that we achieve some sort of economies of scale, and the technology provides that. Um, like in in our case, guide to the Philippines, we're a platform, we're a marketplace, so we allow local operators to to sell to a greater market uh, through the platform for a very uh, for, for pretty much uh, no cost and. Uh, that's one way that you know that's one uh, sort of technology and there are many marketplaces that uh, that these local operators can use to to boost and you know uh and and market themselves to a greater uh to a global market in the future yeah and uh and in terms of innovation of product development i think in terms of the itineraries i already mentioned about uh, having the multi-destination um experience uh, we have to challenge ourselves, you know, instead of just marketing Boracay or El Nido or, or Shargao, how do we tie all of these together and, and create experiences, uh, thematic experiences that will, you know, that will, uh, that will provide these inspired travelers to, to imagine or reimagine a, a, a different sort of uh, uh, experience in the Philippines. So, mm. yeah. And... Uh, yeah, and with that, uh, thank you for AIM for inviting me, and uh, and thank you once again for for all the panelists. Okay, thank you, Rabi. Now, our second active participant is the advocacy specialist and trust of Masungi Geo Research Foundation. May I call on Miss Billy Dumalyang? Hello, hi everyone. So thank you so much um, to the AIM team and all our esteemed panelists. I'm really happy to be here and I got a lot of really interesting insights from our speakers. Um, I'll actually go through some of the key insights that I got per speaker from the lens of Masungi, which is both in tourism and in conservation. So just as a background of where I'm coming from, Masungi uses um, tourism, sustainable low impact tourism to be able to fund to be able to raise awareness for our conservation activities. Um, so as you know, um, the COVID pandemic did not only affect the tourism industry, it also affected the environment um, sector because of the different um, uh, lack of manpower during that time in terms of enforcement. Everybody was focused, let's say, on um, on checking, manning the checkpoints instead of being in the forest themselves. So we did go through a lot of challenges during this time, but as our speakers mentioned, it is also an opportunity that we tried to grab to promote and advance um, our causes. So from Dr. Twinkle, I really love the idea of being able to bring the tourism frontliners, especially in ecotourism destinations, towards the recovery plan or in the recovery plan. She mentioned about displaced fishermen um, being um, hired or engaged for economic activities. And this echoes what Sir Boboy Costas of Cebu actually mentioned in one of our webinars that he actually um, noted Alungisian being able to hire boat guides 
as COVID frontliners, but at the same time as marine sanctuary guards. So I think that's a really creative way to be able to promote both the environment and tourism. And this can also be applied to reforestation. So I'm actually looking forward to what the DNR is looking at when it comes to using the NGP funds to fuel the economy. Um, for Ms. Millet, uh, I would like to echo her opinion on adding value for tourism experiences and trying to avoid discounts. Again, that's one of the best practices to promote sustainability. It's to prove that the experience is worth it, that the safeguards that operators have is something um, that people are, are, are um, okay to spend more for. And the framework that she mentioned about marketing in these times, is, I think is excellent and can be used by everybody. Um, shedding light on the pandemic and what is happening you know, very locally, sharing that story to the audience, I think is very important to engage them. And once they are now free to travel, I'm sure they would love to go to natural places and the places that they used to um, enjoy. So please for assistance, you know, some destinations like us, we have opened donation drives, which I think beyond contributing to our community efforts, it also enhanced our relationship with the, with the travelers, with the traveling community. And inspired travelers being able to leave the place better, rather just, not just leaving no trace, which is the common um, slogan for sustainable travel, but instead leaving things better, I think, is very important thing and engaging them, not just seeing them as um, tourists or sources of revenue, but seeing them as active, active participants in the path to recovery for, for our tourism enterprises and projects. For Ms. Eileen, um, I noted her call for um, a whole of sector approach to making travel more seamless and contactless. And in that area, we're helping um, with a project called Visita, which is an open platform free to use for nature destinations to be able to uh, um, control their carrying capacity, enforce the policies, have people sign waivers and things like this, and manage their data. So that's something that I'd like to invite everyone to um, explore. If you want to partner with us, we've been developing the platform and technology for a year now. So just email us at learn at masumigreserve.com. And then lastly, for Ms. Leslie, I love that we discussed how to reapply the lessons from disaster recovery. I think that's the kind of thinking, thinking that we need now. We need parallel thinking and how we learned what we learned from all of these disasters that happened in the, fa in the past. So my insight here is really that for the environment sector right now, that's our challenge. How do we green the recovery? How do we make sure that the economic stimulus packages include things that contribute to um, climate change and biodiversity loss no, to contribute to the programs against those things. So what is the missing link? The missing link between the environment and the economy might be tourism. And that is one of the key things that we need to work towards um, both for the tourism industry itself and the environment sector. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Billy. And our last active participant for this afternoon would be Ms. Christine Ibarreta, the president of the Hotel Sales and Marketing Association. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to react. No? Um, in behalf of the Hotel Sales and Marketing Association. Association. So this would be my comments and um, learnings from our speakers, our experts and um, our own recommendation as well. Uh, only a few months ago, we, would, who we, we never could have imagined the world would come to a complete stop. Who would have thought that we all would be practicing social distancing or that the large percentage of the population would be under the stay at home order and tourism is halted. Tourism is bleeding in terms of cash flow, morale, safety and security of jobs where we hear daily closing of hotels and motels and retrenchment, ret retrenchments of hotel workers. And um, per DOT records, there were over 428 hotels which opened to accommodate the OFW, seafarers, BPOs, medical workers, banking, telecoms, NGOs, and government. 
COVID-19 is an economic tsunami because any race or nation were not spared. No matter where you are in the world, the hospitality industry was severely impacted due this COVID-19. So what, we, what do we learn from, from this? We have to have response and recovery measures, which were also shared by Attorney Leslie. And uh, we have to respond to recall and recover. And um, from what I've heard from them, uh, these are the things that I can um, say that uh, these, these are the 10 moves on how to restart. We should check our financials. Budget adap adaptivity is vital. Align business decisions to more clearly validate strategies and priorities. Go virtual for more face, face time to stay connected and encourage team members to tell the stories of heroes in their communities like our frontliners. They will be important for morale when we begin to recover. Communicate the importance of safety. Focus on creativity and innovation without spending too much from the marketing budget. Relations matter more than sales. Empower teams to maintain relationships by picking up the phone, face-to-face -face meetings using technology like Zoom, Lark Suite, Google Meetings, and the like. Ensuring customers are important. Listening and allow them to share situations and challenges. Reassure them that business will eventually resume and destinations will recover. Keeping in mind utmost safety of all customers. If they have immediate needs, you are there for them. Relationships matter more than transactions. Support your stakeholders, advice, and empathize. That was also shared by uh, Ms. Millet earlier. Re-educate on resources and retrain staff. Think ahead. Secure future businesses. Design itineraries as what uh, uh, Ms. Billy shared as well. Make your voice heard. Recover past businesses and work on how it can generate revenues for us. Reconvene, re-educate, reassure. Human nature wants to gather, but due to the virus, we can only do that virtually as of now. Prepare. Government and health response will undergo dramatic changes. Learn from data. Research sources and data. Examine them for today or for tomorrow's use. Mobilize and connect your talents. Adapt community talents with volunteer options for the short term. And number 10, expect the unexpected. Be ready with your strategies and tacticals. It will take a lot of persuading to get people to travel again. We all should implement higher, stricter standards on cleanliness, sanitation, hygiene for healthy and safety protocols. We have grown, invested, and evolved despite adversities. We hoteliers are greatly challenged now more than ever, but we have survived SARS, H1N1, Icelandic eruption, Zika virus. We remain resilient and learn valuable lessons. We will overcome, we will recover, we will be inspired travelers. Thank you and stay safe. Okay, thank you, Tin, for that discussion. Now, it's your turn to join the discussion. We will now be answering the question, some of the questions that you have posted in the Q&A page. And Ayla? So, I'll give in the first two questions to our panelists. Are we all ready? So, the first question is from Chester Pasho. Given the challenges in the tourism sector and its path to recovery, will there be substantial need for financing? How will the sector or industry react, or will they be open to non-conventional source of capital to help fund its recovery? So, anyone from the panel? I can well, for the first. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Milia. Ah, well, for the first question, is funding necessary? Uh, necessary. The, the simple answer to that is yes. So, I throw the next couple of questions to Miss Eileen. Okay, so I, I also believe it's a yes, but again, um, how do you get the other sources of funding? So my take is we should start looking at things differently. For example, you have TIEZA. It's an infrastructure economic zone authority, and it talks about infrastructure, but it's in a loose sense. So why not start um, 
funding technology infrastructure for different players, for instance. Some only have static websites. Some don't even have the right email protocols in place. So um, if they're unconventional, that's one of the things that it can start with, that TESA can start funding different types of infrastructure, not, not just roads, um, construction infrastructure, etc. If I may add, in terms of funding, this is Leslie. I think uh, it is important to leverage on development partners, international organizations, as well as uh, private sector support. And how do you now uh, quickly prepare and operationalize some of the proposed recommendations? For example, uh, Department of Tourism, Tiesa, and a few other local governments can leverage on financing from ADB, World Bank in implementing some of the specific uh, upgrading of local infrastructure projects or helping uh, in parallel top up government's loan program, credit facility or guarantee program for the business enterprises. And of course, the assistance to the different uh, communities and uh, tourism industry uh, workers. So. There are opportunities not just for free money through grants, but also to start doing loans, but also find ways that uh, these loans will go to specific uh, projects. As mentioned, clear-cut investments that are no regrets because it is needed anyway. Ila, Ila. Dr. Rodolfo? I yes. just would like to... Uh, I just would like to um, highlight what uh, was mentioned a while ago about the financing. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of leveraging, uh, in, uh, I think it's very important also for those, I mean, for the tourism leaders, especially the local destinations, to be able to find ways to link the, let's say, the smaller or the, let's say, small enterprises with, let's say, relatively bigger enterprises or bigger players because it's possible that the strength of one is actually you know not necessarily the weakness of another but an area for improvement so that they could actually work together so the financing may not necessarily be really in terms of uh, for me in terms of cash but also in terms of providing new business opportunities to each other so uh, especially we can see we can use this in terms of strengthening the agricultural um, supply chain so that more destination could be more um, uh, sufficient or more um, reliant on themselves, more especially in terms of food supply. Uh, and I think that's very important. So diversifying, for example, the, the portfolio of investment opportunities in the area uh, to go into now agriculture, agribusiness, agri agribusiness processing, light manufacturing, can actually broaden the networks of financing support for the stakeholders. Thank you, Dr. Rodolfo. Prof. Nani, would you have yeah, anything? Yeah, just something to add about financing. And, and this will be a challenge to the banking or the lending sector, especially if we're talking about MSMEs. Remember that tourism is a seasonal event. It's a seasonal business. So any instrument that creates fixed liabilities, which have to be serviced each month, is going to be a problem, especially for the MSME. So if we're looking at a designing new financing instrumentalities for, for the small and medium enterprises engaged in tourism, we must be able to inject a certain degree of flexibility in this instrument to be of use for the sector. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. So for the next question, this is from Dijo Sonko. Uh, what do you think of solutions in other countries, for example, in Japan, who plan on temporarily subsidizing local travel? I'll go ahead. Uh, for countries who have more resources or developed countries, they can afford that. But for countries such as ours, uh, especially also local governments where the destination is, it's that push and pull, right? 
and we always say that travel is uh, a want or a luxury. So, of course, uh, with the limited resources, it's, it's difficult. But these are good practices that we can look at and find ways if there are things that we can copy from them or modify. But definitely, I think subsidizing local travel might be difficult. But we can ask government. Ayla? Yes, bro. I'd just like to add, uh, and I agree with Leslie here, uh, the nice thing about Philippine tourism industry is that almost two-thirds of the travelers are local. And, and they have, these people have shown that they have the capacity to actually travel. And my own take and feeling is that if we give them the, if we can show them that it is safe, I think they will without any subsidies. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Any I, ag other uh, I agree with that, mm -hmm. no, that um, sub subsidy may not be necessary. In fact, when we talk about things in the World Travel and Tourism Council, um, they always talk about starting with staycation, that people don't like to have stayed in their house for so long. So the first thing they will do is already go to the different hotels once this opens because they want to be served. They don't want to cook anymore. They don't want home cooking. They want to just be somewhere else. And staycation can be the starting point. And even Singapore is already starting with staycation. So um, just to mention, they will want to travel even if it's just a mile, a kilometer away or even very far, but they will. Thank you, Ms. Eileen. Dr. Rodolfo, Ms. Millet, any additional insights? Yeah, um, I just would like to go back again to that um, first C of why travel. What is the compelling reason for, let's say, for someone to travel to your destination? So I think this is a question that I think we can pose also to our destinations now. So what is the value proposition that we can offer so to match what Attorney Leslie Cordero mentioned a while ago, um, how can we, um, you know, contribute to this reimagination that a traveler can um, can make? So and we have a number of uh, products that we offer around the country, but the I think the most pressing question is which among of these products right now present that value proposition that will now compel me to travel to your destination once borders actually are uh, opened up or restrictions are eased. Ms. Millet? Yes, I think um, given all of that, <clears throat> once we get the go signal for travel and the myriad of choices we will have for destinations, whether it be one kilometer away, as Ms. Aline said, or 1,000 kilometers away, um, I have always maintained that uh, a lot of people also ask me, how do we reignite the demand for travel? I don't think reigniting it is necessary. It's there. So, yeah, um, as soon as we get the go signal to travel, we're there. But it will take a while to recover from the losses that have been incurred in the past three months. Thank you to our panelists. I think JP has one last question. JP. So, we have been receiving a lot of questions from our participants and I would like to ask one, a one big time question that would summarize everything. How do we balance the need for tourism restart against ensuring the safety for the travelers? I'll, I'll start. Um, for me, kasi, there's several different um, needles that are in play, you know. Um, some feel that it has to be 100% COVID free before you start or you have to move your needle. The only thing we can do is, is to maximize the control of the possible spread, but you cannot control the spread. Meaning, I mean, you, you cannot control the presence of, of the possibility of COVID. So you have to move your needle so long as you can say where you, what is your starting point, where you think you have enough control and not let fear control you. 
uh, because that, as I mentioned a while ago, it's phase three to four. The, the main problem there is the fear. Where are you going to start it? So put things in phases and put clear indicators of how you're going to start things. So if you feel like for aviation, for instance, you can already start with commuter flights that are just one hour flights because it doesn't expose you to a lot of your um, katabe or the ones beside you. So start with that as your first indicator and then move forward after that. But you cannot not start and then expect 100%. So you have to move your needle a little bit more. Well, you know, uh, uh, Milet here, no? uh, the, the travel industry to be able to at least give a semblance of the balance between the two sides of safety and travel. Um, they're, traveling does not, uh, is not dangerless. No? Even just um, boarding the airplane can be scary for a lot of people. But given this particular pandemic, no? and in particular COVID-19, the assurance of first aid in the destination, intervention, and perhaps a remedy Will, will not stop people from, from traveling. And uh, I guess it's uh, when what I meant by go signal means that um, it is not that we beat COVID-19, but there will be you know, remedies and interventions just in case one contracts it while, while traveling. The, the danger is always there, the danger is everywhere, not only from disease, but from a lot of other things associated with traveling. I think what is important in the balancing of interest, and of course, we all know that uh, primordial is health, right, and saving lives, but to help the local governments where the destinations are, prepare to the best that they can. If uh, your organization or government will have a little spare, as much as we can plug in the safety nets, there's no guarantee but the feeling of comfort, security, and uh, safety is there when there are, uh, let's say, equipments or facilities in place that when something happens, uh, the destination has that bandwidth to be able to address uh, the health concern. Yeah. Um, for me, safety is, uh, is really the priority. And when I talk about safety, I know we're talking about COVID-19, but uh, against COVID-19, but even before the COVID-19 pandemic, we actually faced a number of safety-related issues as travelers and as communities, leading, uh, including, for example, transportation accidents in a number of our tourist destinations, lack of facilities to handle, let's say, trauma by those who actually um, suffer from the accidents. So safety is very um, important. And um, I think it's very, what I think of the key messages that we need to maybe include in our communication programs that each traveler must be responsible to take care of him or herself so that he or she can also take care of the community where he will have these footprints later on, whether economic, social, or, or environmental. Because otherwise, if as travelers we're not responsible, then we will destroy the entire ecosystem of the tourism that we're trying to rebuild, you know, given this pandemic. And um, if we look at actually the documentation of what um, destinations are currently doing, um, we see actually very good signs of the restart. It's just that there are some things or elements that need to be placed in their destinations to really boost their confidence that they're ready for travel and tourism. And here I point to, of course, what is always cited, let's say, testing laboratories, uh, availability of supplies for, um, for, um, for, the, for hospitals, availability of supplies for frontliners and the like. So, so I think if uh, we could zero in our, let's say, our recovery program into identifying those priorities to bring us to a higher level of confidence as destination, then the restart for tourism actually will happen. Twinkle, Prof Nani, any thoughts? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so I guess JP, any other question? 
I guess that's it. Okay, so thank you very much for everyone uh, and sharing your questions with us. I hope we answered them properly. You, you have sent us like burning questions, a lot of them, right? So, and finally, to close this event, uh, may I call on Professor Rojas to provide us with the final synthesis and the closing message for us all. Prof. Nanmi. Okay, thank you very much for all the panelists and the participants who joined us today. Uh, just a short message. Uh, this is just the first of a series of webinars that we'll be doing. Uh, most of you know that we've done a large survey. In fact, we have more than 13,000 respondents. And we will be organizing another webinar uh, maybe in three or four weeks from now to present to the people what kind of insights could be gleaned from this particular survey. So watch for that second survey, uh, second webinar because it will be very, very interesting. After saying that, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you to everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. So on behalf of the AIM Dr. Andrew Elton Center for Tourism and the AIM School of Executive Education, I would like again to thank everyone for taking your time to participate in this webinar. So at the moment, while we're closing, we're still at 540, 550. So this is a good number. Thank you for staying with us. So keep in touch and stay tuned for a for our upcoming webinars and have a nice day. Thank you.